Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. I'm reading from the New International Version. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask Him any more questions. We have this sense from the time that we're really young that love means accepting me for whatever I am, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm thinking. Whether my finger's in your eye or my arms are wrapped around you, you should love me. It's not so much unconditional. It has absolutely no criteria at all. Now, because love is so often defined that way in our culture, reading the scriptures can be deeply problematic because the Bible talks so much about love and God's love for us and our love for each other. This passage is full of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, self, and strength. Love your neighbor. At what is he asking you to do? Well, if you hear it in our culture, you either think that he's asking you to long for someone, one of the ways we use the word love, which is an emotional kind of longing, desire, or he's asking you to be accepting of every person you meet. But what does love mean? There are two words translated love from the First Testament, which then get worked into the New Testament. I dealt with the first one extensively. It's the word ahav, and that's the word we find in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and following. Love the Lord your God. That means to choose for. The other word that's translated love from the Hebrew is the word chesed. And chesed has to do with loyalty or faithfulness. So when the Bible is talking about love, and of course the New Testament translates those Hebrew terms with terms like agape and philia and so on. But, but when, when the Bible is talking about love, it's talking about something we choose to do. So here's a quotation from a commentator I've been using quite a lot in the study on Mark. His name is Ben Witherington III. He says this, The very fact that Jesus commands love ought to immediately cause us to realize that something extraordinary is going on here that does not involve mere feelings. Feelings cannot be commanded, but decisions of the will and actions of the body can be. Love is a choice for, hate is a choice against. And love has to do with loyalty, faithfulness, steadfastness. When the scriptures say God loves you, it's really not making a comment about God's emotions for you. When, it's, when the Bible says God loves you, what it means is God has chosen for you. He is loyal to you. He is going to be true to what He has promised you. He loves you. He will be faithful to you. He will neither leave you nor forsake you. He loves you. So all that is wrapped up in kind of the backstory of this passage. And we can't really understand the passage till we get that straight, which is why I started there. It's really from an earlier sermon. But what we find here is that the kingdom of God for Jesus is somehow organized around this principle of loyalty, of faithfulness. And we're going to look at three areas as we move through this, three H's as we move through this passage that I hope will be hooks that you can hang your hats on. The first will be the hierarchy Jesus is being questioned about, which is the greatest, most important commandment. The second is this word here, which is the first word of the passage Jesus quotes, the word in Hebrew, Shema, here. 
And then we're going to talk about the heart of the law for Jesus. Those are our three H's. We're going to start with hierarchy. Look at chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Now those debates are the ones we were talking about in previous sermons. The one about resurrection from the dead and whether there's marriage there. And the other debate. So one of the teachers of the law was impressed with how Jesus handled himself there. And he, he, he had heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. And we're just going to stop right there. Because we need to get clear what is being asked of Jesus. The Greek uh, doesn't read what's the most important. It, it literally says, which is the first commandment? And Jesus responds by saying, the first is this. Now, that could mean most important, but I don't think it does. We have to be careful that we don't misread this exchange. As though the Jewish people recognized there were 613 commandments in the first five books of our Bible. They call them the Law of Moses. This teacher is not asking Jesus to replace 613 commandments with one. In the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, there was a great debate over how these commandments should be organized. How should these 613 commandments be arranged? What is the spirit of the law? What is the logic that undergirds them? So, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, I preached on the story of Jephthah in the book of Judges. Some of you may remember the sermon, but just to catch you up, Jephthah was in a situation where he had made a vow that he was going to kill whatever came out of his house when he came back from battle if God gave him victory. So he made that vow, and he knew in the law it says, keep the vows you've made to God. But when he got home, the first thing to come out of his house was his daughter. And the law also says, do not offer your children as sacrifices. So how does he obey? The law is contradicting itself. You have to keep your vows, but you can't kill your kids. So what do you do? How do you make those decisions when the laws intersect and you're sitting in a moment where you have five different things that all seem to speak to it and you don't know what you should do? That's what he's asking Jesus. How should we organize the law? What's the spirit of it? Was there a heart, an organizing principle? We know what the letter of the law is. We have 613 of them written down. We've all memorized them. But what is the spirit of the law? How do we adjudicate this situation or another? When it comes to interpreting and applying the law of God, what should be considered first? What's non-negotiable? Is there a hierarchy of importance? Should anything be heavier, weightier in our decisions than something else? And Jesus' answer to that question is a resounding yes. There is an organizing principle. Look at verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Or the first one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Now the Hebrew word for hear is the word Shema. And Shema means to hear, but it means more than that. It means obey. For Jesus, the organizing principle around which all of God's requirements for his people must be organized is the central confession that God alone must be listened to, must be obeyed. God alone. His voice will always come first. We seem to assume commonly today that who God wants us to be can be discovered through introspection, through scrupulous self-examination. Whoever we're to be, whoever God may want us to be, it's hidden deep within the recesses of my own heart and soul. And the way I'm going to know what God wants is by shutting off all exterior things, sealing myself off, meditating, looking deeply into my heart and discovering what makes me tick. Somehow that desire, that passion, that stuff that we discover about ourselves is the avenue to truth. This is who God wants me to be. We might even say very piously, this is who God made me. But our eye for Jesus is to be fixed on God. 
who we are, remember Colossians, we keep quoting this, is hidden with Christ in God. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We are to fix our eyes for the Shema on God alone. This is the organizing principle of the law. The heart of the law of God in any culture at any time and in any age is the requirement that we listen to and obey the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became flesh in the person of Jesus. Above all other lords, above all other masters, above all other voices, even our own, even our culture. How do we organize the law? That's the hierarchy question. How do we begin? We listen only to God. That's how we hear. We obey Him. And third is the heart. What is the heart of the law? Look at verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. For Jesus, complete and whole person loyalty to God first and then to one's neighbor are the first considerations, the weightiest items to consider in any real life decision. In other words, the discernment process for those who are really living into the kingdom of God begins with what has God said? When we make any decision, it becomes the first question. What has God said? And it's immediately followed up with what effect will this have on those in, whom, in whose midst I live? The heart of the law is that listening to and obeying God is a whole life commitment of loyalty to God which expresses itself as loyalty to those amongst whom we live. Verse 34, Jesus says to this, this teacher of the law, He saw that he had answered wisely, and he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The question that we have to ask is are we organizing our lives around loyalty to God and to neighbor? Or are our lives organized around other priorities that are really the central poles around which we make our life decisions? Ben Witherington says this, Is Jesus really suggesting that we should care as much about our neighbor's welfare, our neighbor's health, our neighbor's education, our neighbor's finances as we care about our own? It seems that the answer to this is yes. What is the greatest commandment? What is the commandment around which all others must be organized? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. How would your life change if you were to organize it around those ethics? What, what would happen tomorrow? What would happen if you organized your ethics, your values, your priorities, and all that around the call to listen to and obey God only, and to behave in loyalty and solidarity with your neighbors? What would happen if the first question you asked in every decision is, what has God said? And the second one, what effect will this have on my neighbors? You see, we can't follow Jesus and reject His Lordship. We can't follow Jesus and reject his logic. We can't follow Jesus and reject his priorities. To live into the kingdom of God is not to live without law. We are not called to live lawless. But we are called to live the laws we live out of these two polar gravitational forces. Our loyalty to God above all else and our loyalty to our neighbor as our second most pertinent concern. 
This is the condition of his covenant.